How is everyone today? Hopefully you're doing well and you have finished your the homemade quilt and you've moved on from that. And today we're, we're going to start um, a number of classes that will be one or two weeks long for a, for a little while before we start another project. And I'm excited about some of the things that we have to show you today and some possibilities of what you might do with them. Again, as always, um, I have added a hashtag at the bottom lower left. Um, we talked about it um, when I first started and I really haven't mentioned it since then. But um, for some of the pictures and the things that you do, hashtag the quilt show Saturday sampler is a great way for all of us to be able to see that too on Instagram. So um, Willow and Lynn, thank you for popping into uh, the chat box. Good to see you guys. Um, it's always nice to look up and, and um, I would consider you friends, um, although we've never met, but um, it's nice to see you on the, on the chat box with that. So Pat and Linda, welcome. And then um, also, you know, the chat box is there. Please ask questions. Please um, share with each other information that you have. And if you've done some of these things, please let us know and let us you know um, glean from your experiences as well because we all have something to learn and it's great to see what others um, have have learned from classes they've taken from people they've met all of that good stuff so while people are popping in we can um, take a minute uh you know i i do talk about the weather a lot here i don't know why i do that because it's not that big of a deal to me but we have something that I was not expecting here. I know across the, the United States, we've had some crazy weather. And some of you are dealing with um, lack of electricity, uh, lots of snow, danger on the roads, all of that. And we uh, are two here. We've got about five inches of snow. And it's snowing right now. I can look up at the window and, and see it falling. It's quite beautiful outside. But for uh, a place that's not equipped for snow, it's a, it's a little bit crazy. And I wasn't expecting to come back to snow when I moved back to California. So anyway, hopefully you're all doing well. You're in, you're warm, you're doing the things that you love and, and uh, you and your family are safe. So today... The topic that we are going to be working on is called Kalandi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It originated in Africa. It also is very similar to Cantha stitching, and which also originated there. It traveled through just migration to India, and they do a lot of uh, Cantha stitching with their with old saris and leftover fabrics and things like that and so kawandi is the same thing when uh the quilts are done or clothing have you know had their time and they use the scraps and things left over to create these incredible quilts uh, bed coverings in I know that in some places they, they even use them as table coverings, uh, curtains, uh, wall um, hangings, all of those kinds of different things. So I'm very excited about the Kawandi stitching today and I am using the fabric, uh, at least some of it, because I'm, I'm not making a very big um, piece right at this time, but it's a great way if you're, you know, you're done with a quilt and you have lots of small pieces and you feel like you, like all of us, you can't throw it away because something inside of you just says, don't do that. So I have cleaned up a little bit of some of the smaller pieces that I had, and I'll show you that and started working on this. So let me drop down to my table. And I want to talk a little bit about the things that we're going to need to do the project today. First of all, <clears throat> we're going to need needles. And I pulled stuff that I have uh, out and pr 
probably out of all that I had, for me, the Sashiko needles that we had for a project that we did a while back when we taught um, Sashiko stitching are very sharp. They're long. They, they seem to go through the fabric pretty easily. I also had some sharps and they worked pretty well as um, with that. The other thing that you can use is cruel needles. These are a little bit big. If you use heavier threads, these are excellent for that. But for what I was working with um, to put the first layer down, I wanted a, a little bit smaller needle than that. And so needles are one thing. And I know that the store has a variety of needles and definitely they have the Sashiko needles from our last project and they carry them. So do that. Then there's the thread. And really, truly, any thread that you have will work. Here I'm using a DMC, and it's uh, number 10. It's a little bit thick. It's not too thick. It's, 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 it's not too bad. It's not quite as thick as what I would use for maybe embroidery. But embroidery floss would work. Any type of thread. Here is another one. This is more... Uh, this is a number 16, and it, it's something that I picked up along the way somewhere. Um, it, the, it's Finca thread, and uh, I think I was given this or picked it up someplace. And it's a little bit thinner, and that's what I started with, simply because it, in a minute when we start with this, you're going to see why I wanted a little bit thinner for my first row with the... With the um, stitching on that. So you'll need thread needles. I found that for me this was helpful. It's thread conditioner and I simply ran my uh, thread through it and gave it a little wax coating, um, kind of conditioned it. It pulled through a little bit easier and it uh, the thread didn't tangle and knot up. So that was a helpful um, piece. And then I, a thimble. Uh, I use these little leather dots uh, and I, I believe that they have them in the store. Kristen can probably put up a link or something to that if they are in there. I like them because I've never really learned to use a thimble um, adequately and these work really well for me and I just simply put them on the finger that I'm going to be pushing my needle with and they stick on this one I've used three or four times and it's still very sticky on my finger and I use that to help push the needle through. Then the other thing that I found rather helpful in terms of, of this was, this is masking tape, but it um, it's printed as a ruler. And actually I like the washi tape one better because it is smaller. It's only about a quarter of an inch wide and I can stick it onto that. But for whatever reason, I couldn't find it this week. Um, that's what happens when you move uh, twice in two years. You lose things along the way. And so, but I used this and it gave me, it can give you, uh, you know, how far apart to put your stitches and kind of keep them neater if that's important to you. And I know for some, um, that is very important to keep your, your stitches um, even. So this is a very helpful tool with masking tape. And I put that um, along the edge and then I run it. So to get started, I have a pile here of my leftover pieces and I just cut them into, um, and they aren't even perfect. Uh, some of them I just cut with my scissors. But I took all my scraps and I cut them and put them into rectangles and squares uh, whatever and I, I have a pile of them that I'm going to be using and I will show you how I deal with them as I as I work and then here is the beginning of my 
it's going to be a wall hanging or a tape a table topper is really what it's probably going to become with the leftover backing material that I had I cut a square and to be truly honest I don't even remember how big this uh, rectangle I think it's a rectangle actually I, I think it's 22 by around 17 or 18 somewhere in there and it was just a leftover piece at the end when I was done cutting for the handmade quilt and I turned up the edges as you can see right here I folded those up about a quarter um, you can go a quarter to a half an inch and I folded over and ironed those down and then I started in a corner and with Kawandi what you're going to do is you'll you'll fold under your pieces and here I folded it um, this particular one I actually uh, folded it on three sides but you can start with folding your fabric on two sides under and matching those corners up and matching along the edges and I started and I began the process of sewing right as along the edge and here you can see the stitches a little bit better and I tried to keep them fairly uniform I at that point I was not using any tape or anything I was just sewing um, because that's really what they what they do and these are all different sizes they're all different shapes and part of the the beauty of this is that you kind of create it as you go now I would recommend probably um, I've start. I've done a, a couple of these. I don't have um, some of the work that I've done any any longer. I tend to um, pass them on or do other things with them. But I have come up all the way along, and I'm just ready to finish this side so that you can see what I am doing. I used pins to hold them in place as I folded it over. Um, because I don't really want raw edge. With Cantha, raw edge is used more frequently with the long stitch. And with the Kwanda, Kwandi, Kwanda, uh, they overlap the stitches. And when I come to these crossings where I overlap, I want to make sure that I hit that fold right in place. Now I, and with Cantha, you, you sew straight lines across or horizontal, vertical or horizontal, whichever. And sometimes I've seen, um, at least on Instagram and Pinterest and places like that, where people have created uh, these quilts that they have gone in many different directions with cantha stitching and with the quandi stitching they go completely around and will stop at the end right here then um, whatever distance you want to make and oftentimes um, when i looked up and found the information that I needed a, a few years ago on Quandi stitching that they would take their small finger and put it beside and that would give them how far apart they were going to do. But I've also seen where the stitching sometimes is this far apart and sometimes it's a little further and they will make um, a design even in their stitching. But you go around and then you start again and you go all the way around, you know, uh, and then you just keep going and it's not really a sp kind of a spiral because you close it with each round so let me stop there for just a minute and see if there are any questions or comments um, is that tape in two tqs store that i don't know i i would probably doubt it but you can pick it up pretty much anywhere you buy masking tape all right. Um, 
and that no that looks like the row of patches were sewn together first before you put them down is that right no it is not i put them on one at a time so we're getting to the batting here in just a minute um the backing that i'm using is a piece of the uh, fabric from the handmade quilt it's it was just the background fabric and my camera is as focused, I will do it again, but um, my camera is pretty much focused. I, I just took it again. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute how we stop and start new pieces of thread. Um, yes, and as far as inside, I just wanted to see about, you know, getting this together. So this is the new piece that I am going to put on. I'll remove it so you can see that they are not sewn together and when I got to this point I have raw edge here and I have a folded edge um, here and this piece I was going to use somewhere else but by the time I had folded it under it did not stay where I wanted it to so when I and I'm going to be starting a new thread here in just um you know just a moment because I'm almost out of my thread here and I will show you how to start and stop that so basically um, it was easiest for me and and you're gonna find that you will do this however it works best if I anchored this got it with the sides if I pressed it over a little bit I was able to sew a little bit more and I'm just simply doing a running stitch and this is where you know um, the thimble you know the little um, leather dots whatever will you know work in um, really well and so I'm going to take two more stitches And then I want to put this piece down. Now, I am going to put the, let's see, raw edge that I have on this side. It is going to go underneath of my folded piece over here and even with the top. And here is where I would probably put a pin I I was finding that pins were sticking me all over the place and I think that I would um, probably use some glue um, to to glue these these spots in place um, as I work along so now as you can see I've put this underneath And I want to hit that directly at the edge of that piece. And I'm doing this kind of awkwardly. But I want to come up and I want to hit that corner so that, that those two pieces are connected together. So I'm going to take just a little bit of a stitch and come back um, underneath because that for me is the easiest way for me to hold it and that was kind of a crooked lousy stitch there but you'll see it's going to be overall it's a handmade um, quilt it has its own basic charm if you will and so that is pulled these two pieces now are connected and I will tell you that this becomes tedious around the edges because you're going through four layers of fabric so that's why you need a really sharp um, needle one that goes through those fabrics well and easily for you and so I'm just moving along until I get close to that edge and again, I am simply doing a running stitch. And that one got a little big. Um, I think I've mentioned it before. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And uh, 
I guess I can't really talk and sew at the same time the way I'd like to. So you can see that um, hopefully that there's a running stitch. Now I want to put this one because this is the one I folded over. All right. And that's going to lay right on top of that other one. And I've got a few threads that I want to get out of my way. And I don't want them to show through on the back side uh, because they are dark threads. So I'm just going to get rid of those threads that are hanging out there. And get those aligned. And I think I'm going to go ahead and put my pin there. Uh, and this is why I kind of don't like to use the pins uh, because they push you've got two folded layers there, you've got two folded layers there, and you've got another two folded layers there. So when you're putting it through those thicknesses, they tend to um, push that thread down. But I'm going to hold it until I and here because I have so many layers, I just take one stitch in right at the edge so that these two now are connected and I'm going to come up again right at the edge of my checkered piece so that has it is good and tight there and now I'll bring it back down and I'm sewing um, approximately a quarter of an inch away From the edge so on the edge you are not putting any batting in the quilt at this point because you really don't want batting um, where we are and this is where they used old clothing and in just a minute when I get to the edge of this then we'll show you the next step And here is where I will also show you how I finish so that the knots are not on the outside. So I've come up to the edge. Now I'm going to take my needle and I am going to bring it up between those two layers. All right. And then I will make my knot. And I'm going to just bury it. So I'm going to just take a stitch in two and bury that knot in there. And then I will cut it off right here. Um, so it flows into the inside of that. And... I took the time with the rest of my edging to press it um, down just so that it would lay nice and flat and and everything and so that's what I would do here as as well so that is how you you keep going all the way around your your piece so I you know started in this corner added the next piece over the top the next piece came over that and i just kept folding under and adding pieces as i went around so now i have this and i'm gonna go back and um, work from where i started all right so now i have this corner and all these pieces basically are flopping out I had made my grandchild a one of these gauze blankets and I want something that and so I have two pieces that were left over at the end and surprisingly these two pieces fit exactly the width that I need in here so I am 
going to do exactly what the women um, did and still do is that you take and you put your and if you're using batting I would use a easily needled batting um, I would not use a warm and natural because it does not needle real well and so you simply lay your batting and fit it all in make, making sure you get it into the corners and I have two pieces so when I get to that point where I need to add the other one when I'm sewing I will do that but you simply stick it in there all the way down and I'll work and adjust as I as I go with that um, because my camera space is is a little bit small so now I have this gauze it's my batting it's going to be easy to needle through I'm kind of excited about the possibility of using that now because I have enough material that I can do several rows before I have to add the next piece then I will um, I will get started with that but let me show you that if you come to a place like these funny little spots here that you're simply going to take a you know whatever square you want to take and this one I can have it come literally over this one and then that will take care of so I will turn it under you can finger press um, I like to use the iron personally because it just stays a little bit better and I'm just going to press it under all the way around and once I get that pressed all the way around then I'm going to lay that on top and when my stitching and I'm going to put it there so that my next row of stitching is going to hit right along that edge. And sometimes it will hit perfectly. Sometimes it'll be a little bit in. It's going to be a little bit different each time. But you're going to turn those edges in and you're going to keep adding those all the way along um, as you work. And in terms of doing the Kwandi, I'm going to stop for a minute and I want to look at what you've been asking um all right yeah so old clothes inside um other fabrics batting whatever you have do you have another layer as well i'm not sure what you're asking monica but this would be the end of it i have my backing i have my inner piece my my batting and then this is my top layer and I keep working around um, the sides until I finish in the middle and the last piece that goes on would be the end of the quilt and that would make up the layers um, are the patches just ironed down uh, they're they're not really ironed down you, you lay them down and begin your work so if I was taking for example this piece and I have turned it under on both sides when I if I was sewing along and I'm coming up to this edge with my with that I know I need to add another piece so I would lay this down and then I would continue sewing right along here um, and then I would turn my corner and start adding pieces so then my next piece would you know I'd fold it under lay it over fold this edge under lay it over and just keep stitching so you're adding as you stitch um, so the rows are only connected where you stitch the lines. You can slip a pencil in between the lines of sewing once they're in, correct? You could, but the truth of it is, is because you've sewed your edge um, all the way along the outside edge, there's no way you could put a pencil in there 
at all. And your stitching, I mean, you could lay something in between here, but once you start stitching all of this down, it's not going to make, you know, you're not going to be able to put anything between it and it's going to hold together very well. And, um, yeah, safety pins would work. The other thing that would work as well, too, these are those um, sew tights from um, Tula Pink. And they, the magnetic part on this, these are very strong magnets. And you could certainly put one on the underside and one on the top and hold things in place. And I was using some of those. I've made my own with strong magnets that I got at the hardware store and made a button top um, and put a magnet in. Instead of the backing of the button, I put a magnet in there. And so, but the sew tights, and they've had these in the store as well. And again, um, so pins, safety pins, um, the sew tights, you know, whatever. Uh, but you're just adding to this. And maybe something that they're is there a reason that you are stitching from the back? The only reason is, is because it's easier for me. Um, but most of the time you, would, and when I get here, I'm going to be stitching from the top. It was that first layer so I could make sure that I was keeping it right at the edge. It was just easier. Um, but no, um, my next row, as you're going to see when I start it, is that I will be stitching across the top of this. All right. Um... Where do you put tape on the fabric? Let me just show you. Um, find the start of this. So if I wanted to keep my stitches even, so I'm going to start, and my next row would be about here. So um, I would put that down where I the, the place that I'm going to start would be right here and then I would just use those eighth inch or if I was making bigger stitches to the quarter and I would lay it and I would just follow alongside the tape and that way I would keep my stitches a little bit more uniform so that's where the tape would come into play um and I don't know what that is you're attaching your backing to the first outer row of scraps. Correct. My backing is now attached, and the, the this first row is also attached. Yes, I attach the back first, and then I put the batting in. You could go back and add more stitching if you felt that uh, your stitching was too far apart and you wanted to add some more stitching, you certainly could do that. Do your lines of stitching in one direction, yes. Where can we buy the cool tape? I bought it, I think, um, You can buy it anywhere they sell masking tape. I might have got this at Home Depot or uh, Lowe's, someplace like this. I want to show you this because I think this will be helpful. Um, you could also do this by machine. You don't have to do it by hand. Although the stitching on it, to me, gives it so much texture and looks really great. I had made a piece that I had done I sewed pieces together with the sewing machine. So all these pieces are really far more aligned together because I sewed them down to a piece of a batting and backing. And then I decided to make this little uh, pouch and I just did, you know, some long stitching on it, some French knots, some of those kind of things. But I wanted to show you that here the stitching I put it into type of a pattern I put two rows close together I doubled about that distance put two more rows and I used um, contrasting thread here I used a thread that blends in a little bit more but gave a lot of texture and here my seams are about a little over a quarter of an inch apart on that here I went um, vertical 
and the the stitching is a little bit further apart i don't know if you can how well you can see that in the camera on this side i again used a contrasting thread i made the stitching a little bit further apart and that kind of thing on this side you can you can see that i did a row left a big space closed in the spaces and did so many rows opened it up and you could continue that way um, I even uh, put a zigzag with the you know the machine because I was playing around but I, I use this and and take it with me to retreats and stuff and here I followed the lines in the stripe so it's really what you want to do and then I took that piece that I had done and I just made a simple zipper bag um, to carry stuff um, in. So this is more, I would say, what I was doing. Um, I don't know that this is more like Cantha. It's just I did my own thing. And I always encourage that. Uh, you know, this is the concept of this. What the women did. They got a piece of fabric, something large, um, in India, I know that they used old saris and used those as backing, put another sari in um, this the center as their batting and then layered another on top, folded it under and sewed all along the edges and then, you know, did the stitching across that. And with the Kwandi, it was the small scraps left over, putting it all together onto a top and this is basically how they did it they fold they just simply folded it under as they came to the next part and sewed it and so i'm gonna start with my next piece let me check that the Quandy on a machine, Charlene, absolutely. And if your machine has that um, hand stitch so that it looks like you hand stitched, perfect. And it goes a whole lot quicker. I am working around the entire quilt in um, parallel lines. So it, if this was the total quilt, my first row would have been sewn then i would have moved in however far i'm coming in and sewn here then the next one would have come in until i just had the last piece in the middle and so that is how it is sewn together with that so again i have a knot on the bottom and what i'm going to do is i'm going to go in between and start right here. So I went in between my backing and my top at this point because it's easy to do. Then my knot is on the inside of the quilt, but I can simply pull that knot through. Now with the, on the top, I can use the tape as a guide or I can just go for it. And I am just taking and stitching in a you know basically uh, a running stitch and here is where I use you know and I I lost my leather dot I need to get a new one um, and so I'm I'm simply going right along the tape and I am stitching a running stitch And I think this is a, a fairly good, it's about a half an inch apart of the rows. And I, for me, I think that'll be, that'll be a good uh, width uh, along here. And in just a second, you're going to see where I'm coming up on, you know, my next piece that is not, a, you know, attached except at the edge. And um, so I'm going to. So when I go down, I'm going to come up right at the edge of that 
of that piece right there so that let me move this tape so you can see so you know my stitching a little bit more uniform because I follow the tape more or less and I came up right at the edge so that edge is attached and now I'll just you know keep working with that you know running stitch and I will have to say that it you know right at that point where you know you have the two layers that it goes under and you have this one layer um, it's you know it's a little tougher to pull that thread through but not too bad and so I'm simply doing a running stitch again and you can see and I will keep, keep doing that and so when I get all the way around and I come back and I will end right here where I started my next row will start right in here about a half an inch away and I will do that all the way around and I will keep going adding pieces when I need to and that will completely be um, sewn down you're gonna have a piece of fabric and a wall hanging that's got a ton of texture um, as you can as you can see here it just adds so much texture to your work uh, those those lines of stitching and this was just a play and a practice of things that I might be able to do with this um, but it makes for a very sturdy little bag um, it worked really well for that so let me go back and check the questions I am working around the entire quilt in parallel lines I am NOT doing one patch at a time and I'm this weight of the thread that I am using right now is 16 I think it's a an embroidery or a tatting thread um, I was learning to tat at one time and I think this was a, a tatting thread that I was using and so it's a 16 but you can use any weight that you want to and just change your needle size so that your thread goes through the needle the way it should on that and if you have any questions on what size of needle to use for what size of thread go to the superior threads website and they have great charts that will tell you all of those things and I'm sure you can find them in other places too um, hand sewing is too slow for me I get it and the machine will work great as well so there are open folded edges between lines of stitches yes um, do you always overlap or do you sometimes slide your next piece under the edge that's already turned under yes you are correct Lynn I do that I don't always overlap sometimes I will slide my next piece in depending on you know how it was folded the first time do you make mark do you mark any lines to follow to keep your lines straight I don't I, I eyeball it for me I feel that it gives it that more um, it, it gives it a look that's not totally perfect with that but you could certainly take a pencil or a chalk line and draw it if you know if your lines are wobbly or you're not sure that you could keep it you know a half an inch apart absolutely draw lines on it Um, starting small is a good idea and it's a very good practice and it is a cool technique and it's a lot of fun when I'm watching TV at night this is is a great project and you know within a, a movie I have quite a bit done um, I did the whole outside edge um, watching one show um, so it was it it goes quickly when you're when you're working with it Charlene you're absolutely right these 
are not considered finished until there are triangles sewn on each corner. I was getting to that, and you are correct, Carol. The meaning of this is more about tradition and, you know, that it closes in and it brings good luck to the maker. And so when you are completely done with the top, you would take, let me see if I can find something close to a square here. You would, you would simply take a, a, a square and do it like this. And they would often leave it open and it would kind of, you know, flap there. So you've got basically a triangle and this isn't a complete square. And that triangle then would be sewn and the edges would be left undone. I, I am going to um, close in this. So I'm going to sew a triangle and clo close it in, but that's to bring in the good luck. But uh, it still will because it will still be open as a triangle, but I'm just going to close the, the sides and, and get rid of the raw edges so it doesn't fray on me. Uh, you can also use tassels, something like that. But you are correct. It was a it was a ending piece to this. It was to bring good luck, and that's as far as I know on that. I didn't research that a ton uh, with other than that statement. So if you find anything else out, please let us know. I used flannel instead of batting. Good job. I'm glad you're excited. Um, how big would you be suggest to start with? I would start with no more than what I did. You know, maybe a fat quarter size or even less. And you can, you know, you can make that into a small bag or you can just use it as a wall hanging. These fabrics together are beautiful. I laid, you know, a bunch of them out. It, it's going to make for, if you're using from the kit, the backing is just straight cotton. It was the cotton background for my handmade quilt that I just did um, with all of you. And so it's just a piece of, of the background. You can use anything you want on the back. And I know that right now in modern day um, Kwandi quilting, um, that they are using batik too. My only thing about batik, if you're going to use your sewing machine, batik would work great. I think it would be lovely. And, but batik is a little bit harder to hand sew through. And you, they are, there are needles, uh, they're black and they're coated so that they go through and if you could get them large enough for the thread that you're using, I think that would be a good a good way to go. But you can use any fabric that you really want to. So, um, yeah, it's just all cotton except for my batting. I used that gauze because I knew it would it would give it you know the depth and the weight that I needed, and also it would be easy to needle through, and I wouldn't have to. Um, you know, struggle so much with getting the needle through all of the layers with that because I, you are using a little bit heavier thread. And so I've got those two. I will work on it this week so that next week you will be able to um, see a little bit more of what I've done and how I've added more to that. But basically, this is how it's put together. So you start with a, a, you know, a square, a rectangle, however big that you want to make it. And if you look at pictures and study the history of the women and crafts in those parts of Africa where they do the Kwandi quilting, you will see them all sitting around a large piece of fabric and they're all sewing and they're all adding pieces in the section where they are and someone will come along and pick up and, and keep going. And it's a social thing. It's very much like our quilting bees that our, you know, our parents and grandparents um, had. And it was, a, it was a time of socialization as well as getting a piece of material that they needed for bed coverings, for keeping cold out 
of their homes by hanging them on the walls and they also use them sometimes as curtains whatever um, example of batting to use i would use a, a very lightweight easy to run your needle through so a polyester a very low loft polyester i would not go with a, a, a you know a heavy loft because it's going to be far more difficult to sew through so a low loft uh, easy needling a piece of cotton a piece of flannel any of those kinds of things that needle very easily the only you know batting is the one that that uh, keeps this the scrim in it and you know the warm and natural has that scrim and it's very difficult to sew through and so I would not recommend that and um, Hobbs is is would be fine as long as you got the white no scrim in it that would be that would be good in there so um, you're gonna get your backing fold it over a quarter of an inch and then you're going to get your squares you'll fold them under and align them with the edge of your quilt and sew those all the way around then you're going to put your batting in and so it would be laying on the inside of that you're going to start sewing and when you come to an area you know this is going to be three four i could maybe get five rows of stitching probably only four and then i'm going to lay the next you know block down so that it's you know it's covering that that area and it's going to be covering that little piece up there so i've got it all you know laid in turned under and you know then i can you know sew vertically along that and it can be turned under as much as you want or as little as you want so that you're catching it as you're moving along so if i was sewing here and i got to this piece right here um, this is sewn under i would try to uh, make sure that my strip was right you know kind of along there and I can and I can just keep moving there's a little bit of a difference here so I would probably fold it under a little bit more bring it down I've seen where the modern you know they designed they made it look like a um, log cabin they had other you know uh, symbols and patchwork in it that they you know would lay on the top after it was all done and stitch those down in another fashion um, around the edges of those on top of it there's many there's many ways that you can see this done but this is basically how it is accomplished it's not difficult as long as you understand that you are going around the squares and you're ending up and they're parallel lines all the way around your quilt um, all right so with that I am excited about you know uh, doing this you know this kind of thing for you because I think that you can find many places and ways to use these examples you know in other techniques and always you know whatever you can do to make it your own I would say go for it and you know use it and create things that speak to who you are uh, with this and this was a tradition that was passed down and it migrated to other countries and other places and they put their own spin on it and so it's it Kantha and Kawandi are similar uh, biggest difference is that Kantha uses um, horizontal or vertical lines and they're parallel to each other and it's raw edge where because they use large pieces and often the saris and so they didn't need to do the folding uh, but if you have lots of scraps and you want to use this for something this would make a great kids quilt with all kinds of kids fabrics that kind of thing and wall hangings uh, utility quilts they would be fabulous for that and certainly your machine would make it go a lot faster 
Um, and it would make a beautiful frame for a quilt piece. Absolutely. I agree with you, Monica. So that is it for today. Hopefully you got the information that you needed. And next week we will be doing, I believe, you know, I'm not going to say because I'm not totally positive all of a sudden of what I'm doing. Um, but we are going to be working through... Uh, some surprise new items and introducing new tools to you. I will be doing other countries, uh, you know, the quilting from other places and how we incorporate it into what we do with our quilting, as well as um, I know that one of the blocks that was requested was the cathedral window. So that's coming up and I think that might be what I'm doing next week. So you have a wonderful week. And for those of you who are going to give this a try, good luck. Have fun with it because it is quite a bit of fun. And uh, all of you, you're very welcome. I, I, I love, you know, offering new things uh, to you so that you can create your own masterpieces, um, if you will. So have a great week, and I will see you next Saturday.